That's a good start. <laughs> Amen. Good to see you this morning. You're looking good today. Praise the Lord. Christmas time is here. All the crazies are driving around the streets. Be prepared. Amen. It is good to see you today. We are approaching Christmas. Do want to just plug real quick again our Christmas Eve service on Christmas Eve. That's what we call it, the Christmas Eve service. But it's going to be a fun time, exciting time. Lord, we have some children doing some stuff, some praise, worship time. And it's just going to be a, a real fun time with the Lord. You don't want to miss it. It's a one-hour service. Uh, it's a tradition around here. If it's not your tradition yet, make it because you'll enjoy it. Bring friends and family with you if they're in town. And uh, let's just have a good time that Christmas Eve and just kick off the season of the celebration properly. Amen. Worshiping the Lord together as his bride. Well, I read a story the other day about a little girl sitting in the art classroom. She's in kindergarten working diligently on her little draw and she's working hard at it. And the teacher came over and said, you know, honey, what do you, what do you draw in there? She said, well, I'm drawing God. She's kind of puzzled for a moment. She said, well, um, you know that uh, no one knows what God looks like. She quickly responded, well, they will in a minute. <laughs> Bottom line is that's the story of Christmas. Look at the manger. See that child. You're going to know what God looks like? Here you see God in flesh, veiled in uh, deity, veiled in, in incarnation of humanity. Uh, we talked about that some last week. We'll talk about it more next week when I'm going to talk about the virgin birth. But I, I want us to look, you know, as while we're getting ready for the Christmas season and approaching it all, uh, just to talk a little bit about the incarnation of Jesus, where God becomes a man, a little bit more from the prophetic view. Before Christ is born in Bethlehem, there are hundreds of prophetic verses in the scripture which talk about Messiah, what he'd be like, when he would come, what would be the situation uh, economically, what would be the situation government-wise in, in the world they lived in, what would be happening uh, uh, with the child, how the child would be born by a virgin, how the child would have to take flight to Egypt. All those things were, were predicted. All those things were prophesied in very clear terms. And if you went down a checklist of all those prophetic verses in the Old Testament, about the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ and the first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, you just mark them off. They were, they were all fulfilled. I mean, right on. And then all those prophecies about his life, how he would die even. Not only how he would born, where he'd be born, how he would die. You know, the crucifixion clearly spelled out prophetically thousands of years before Christ came. And that's one of the reasons I have such strong faith in the Bible. You just can't get around how all these things were uttered, you know, and every one of them just was fulfilled so, so incredibly and so uniquely to fulfill those passages of Scripture. Well, I want to look at one specifically today uh, that, that talks about it and the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ and most specifically when he would be born. Hopefully in looking at this today, you'll get a little glimpse of your own uh, situation, your own life and see how important it is to, to take heart to the word of God and what the Bible has to say because every word of God is true. In fact, there's this story in Genesis 49, and let me just read the story to you. If you have your Bible, you can open it up. I do have it up, but it talks about this particular person. Until Shiloh comes, or some a phrase that's found nestled in this verse. This, this, and it's a prophetic verse given by Jacob as he gathers his sons around him. And listen to what Jacob says to him, to, to his sons. Judah, your brothers shall praise you. Your hands shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons will bow down to you. Judah's a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He couches, he lies down as a lion, and as a lion, who dares to rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until Shiloh comes. And to him, Shiloh, shall be the obedience of all the peoples. Now, let me just kind of set the stage for this verse and, and, and uh, what's being done at this particular point in time. I mean, let's, let's just creep back in time to, an, to ancient Egypt, all right? Uh, the Jews are in Egypt at, at this point. They, they haven't been let out just yet. And Judah is laying there in a, in a bedroom as an old man. He has his, uh, uh, Jacob, I mean, is laying there and he's got, he's got his 12 sons gathered around him. He's getting ready to utter some last words. So he brings all 12 sons in and he begins to speak to him. 
And as they're gathered around him, he starts from the oldest to the youngest and he, and he addresses them. He speaks to Reuben, he speaks to Simeon, and he speaks to Levi. And although they have prominent places within the, the, the nation of Israel, he tells them specifically, as far as the leadership, you're disqualified. He goes through the line, he gets down to his son Judah, and we see an entirely different picture where he speaks to Judah. And he tells him in this verse, you know, he says, several things are going to happen to you, Judah. One, you're going to be the leader uh, of the 12 tribes. All the tribes are going to follow your leadership. The second thing from this, this he says uh, that you'll be a strong leader. You'll win great victories in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the future. And, and uh, you'll be pictured as a, as a lion, the, the king of beasts. The tribe of Judah... Your descendants will continue to be ruling the ruling tribe in the far distant future over the nation of Israel. And from your tribe will come a king who will run, rule in all of Israel. And then the fourth thing he says to him, in fact, is not only are you, you're going to be the dominant tribe in the nation of Israel until someone called Shiloh arrives on the scene and he will take the rule at that point. Now, if you go back and you follow the history of the nation of Israel and of Judah in this particular tribe, you'll, you'll see that he did all. He, he became the leader of the 12 tribes. When the children of Israel left Egypt and went into the wilderness, remember the tabernacle was built and placed in the middle of the tribe. So when they would camp, and by the way, there were hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Jews who were in this exodus. When they would camp, the tabernacle would be in the center of the children of Israel, and three tribes would be uh, on the east, and three tribes would camp to the south of the tabernacle. Three tribes would camp on the west, and then there would be three tribes on the north. You read in Numbers chapter 2 through chapter 10, and you see how they, they were laid out, and what the order was, and the organization, and how important it was because there were so many. He said, you'll be a strong leader. You'll win great victories. And he's pictured as the king of the lion of beasts. When the tribes of Israel would break camp and move out, it would always be, you know, the tribe of Judah that led the way out as they began the journeys. The trumpets would be sounding, the flags would be flying, and Judah's tribe would pull out first, leading all the other tribes behind them. And as they go, their banner would be up. And on the banner that they had would be this lion, the sign of the tribe of Judah. Again, he told him that when Israel chose a king, you know, the leaders will come. Now, the first king, Saul, which was a mess, was not of the tribe of Judah, but every king following Saul was of the tribe of Judah. Remember how the people wanted to install a king. And then ultimately, God's king, God's chosen David, is placed upon the throne. And from him, from the tribe of Judah, would come, you know, they, they, they would come this great king David, and they would win a lot of victories through David. Following David, called the man of war, came the man of peace, Solomon. Solomon reigned over Israel. Well, under David and Solomon, the kingdom was tremendously much larger than what the nation of Israel is today. In fact, the whole territory ran from the Sinai Desert right down into Egypt, right to the Euphrates River. I mean, it was a massive territory. He said, you'll be the ruling tribe into the far distant future was the prophecy. And you're going to rule and reign until someone comes, until Shiloh comes. And when Shiloh arrives on the scene, all the people will be gathered unto him. Again, verses, verse 10 of chapter 49. When the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. Now this is one of the early, real early, prophetic verses concerning the Messiah, the, the, the Lord Jesus Christ, how he would come. And remember, it's spoken by Jacob on his deathbed, and to put this in proper time frame for you, this is, this is spoken 1,700 years before the Lord Jesus would be born. Now, the scepter it talks about was, was an ornate staff that would be held by the ruler. It was a symbol of royal authority. They would have the power to be the lawgivers of the land, the one who would issue the statutes. And with the words of Jacob here in, 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 this, in this passage, he predicted that a royal line would rise up from Judah's descendants who would hold that scepter, would be the lawgivers. The one statement uttered by Israel, Jacob, is so graphic, it's so clear and is so concise about Judah's rule and when it would end that many Jews have come and given their lives to Jesus. These would be Jews who were knowledgeable of the scripture 
when Jesus would arrive. Now, it wasn't Jesus in their mindset. It's Shiloh in their mindset or Messiah in their mindset. But there was something that would happen that would be so significant it would mark the end of Israel's sovereignty, national rule, whatever you want to call it, national identity. And at that point, the Messiah would come into the earth. Now, for me as a believer, when I look at this and I begin to go over some of the things I'm going to share with you today, at the conclusion, you'll see why I am a firm believer in the authority of Scripture. I am a firm believer in the accuracy of the Scripture. And I am a firm believer that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the true Lord, and that is who we serve. Now, let's look at the prophetic statement because there's, there's four statements that, that arise out of this, and I'll go past that. It has to do with the royal authority of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, you know, that, that some, there's going to be this indisputable indicator of authority, and when that authority was gone, then Messiah would come. Notice first the descriptions that he gives that we'll, we'll see here regarding Messiah, regarding Shiloh. It talks about his title, and he talks about the time he would come, and it talks about what Shiloh would do in this passage, and it talks about the triumph of Messiah and Shiloh. So let's just walk through that. We'll spend a little more time with one and two than we do with three and four. So, but let's look first of all at the name Shiloh and what it implies. There's, there's three truths about the name of Shiloh and, and what it for, replies. One is that it's a messenger. That's, that's what the word means. Or someone that would be sent on a, on a mission with a message. That is true of a lot of prophets and true of a lot of teachers and a lot of people who've come in the name of God. But n never has it been more true of anyone than of the Lord Jesus Christ. He comes with a mission. He comes with a message. And it's from the Father. In fact, Paul writes of, of, in Galatians, when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. Over and over and over again through the New Testament, you keep seeing very clearly how that Jesus was sent into the world. For God so loved the world that he gave. That's just one of tons of passages. Even Jesus speaks of himself. He says, I, can, I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but to do the will of the one that sent me. In other words, I am on a mission. And I am on a mission with a message. A messenger as well as the message is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. The word shallow also has another meaning, which has to do with the meaning of a peacemaker, all right? In Isaiah 9, 6, there's this prophecy regarding Messiah when it comes, is that he would be called the Prince of Peace. And Jesus is referred to as the Prince of Peace in the New Testament as well. But he comes. And, you know, we talk about Christmas and the celebration. We go back and we read the Christmas story from Luke. The angels are bringing a message and they say, glory to God in the highest, and on earth, what? Peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace with God is what the literal translation is. Peace with God unto all men. And all men who do come to Jesus Christ will experience peace. Paul wrote about it in Romans 5 when he tells us in verse 1, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, Jesus is the ultimate peacemaker of Scripture. He is the only one who can bring peace. The Bible says he gives us a peace that passes understanding. It's without comprehension. Now, people are looking for peace in every avenue of the world today. There just doesn't seem to be peace anywhere in the world. The only place you're going to find a true, a supernatural, a real, lasting peace is in Christ Jesus and a relationship with him. We have peace. We don't live in fear. We talked about that last week. So Jesus is not only the messenger with the message, he is the peacemaker. But the scripture also tells us the third definition of shallow is somebody that's a deliverer. The word literally means it has to do with deliverance through salvation. He saves us. He delivers us from calamity. He delivers us from, 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 a, from an issue, a problem. For us as sinners, the issue, the problem is we're going to die without Christ and go to hell. We'll never be acceptable in God's sight because we've been tainted. We have this sin nature, all right? It hinders us from knowing God. The Bible says no flesh will glory in the presence of God. So we, there's, a, there's a barrier between God and man. It's called our sinfulness. But Jesus Christ comes and saves us from our sins. He's, he's the Savior. 
He, he's the deliverer. I mean, if you're driving down the road at night and you start dozing off and you're heading for the ditch in a telephone pole and someone in the car, your wife, whoever, reaches over and grabs the wheel and pulls you back, they have just delivered you, right? There's someone who has interceded on your behalf. Someone who was an acceptable sacrifice for our sins and his name is Jesus Christ. Here referred to as Shiloh. And he is the great deliverer. I mean, when you start carefully looking at scripture, you see that everything about Jesus speaks in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament that he is our deliverer. Back to Isaiah. Prophetically, God shall send them a savior and a great one. And what will this savior do? He will deliver them. He'll set us free. Set us free from ourselves. Set us free from our sin. Set us free from the, the penalty of our sin. Setting us free from the power of sin over our life. Ultimately setting us free from the very presence of sin when we, when we received into glory. In the New Testament, the announcement of the angels again in Matthew 1. And the angel was instructed from the Lord to instruct Joseph and Mary to name their son Jesus. That's the name Yeshua. What does it mean? For the Lord shall save his people from their sins. The very name Jesus even means that. To deliver us, to save us from our sins. The Bible talks about in Luke chapter 2, again, this announcement of the angels to declare, for unto you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. So we have the announcement to Joseph prior to the birth. We have the announcement to the shepherds at the birth. We have the announcement 2,000 plus years before the birth about Jesus, about Shiloh. He would come. He would be our Savior. And I love Hebrews 7 where the writer is saying, whereby he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him. When we come to Jesus, when we give our life to Christ, we just yield our hearts and lives to him. He saves us. And let's look at that to the uttermost. You can't be any more saved than how Jesus saves you. It's to the uttermost to make sure that you get where you need to be, when you need to be there, when the time comes, when death knocks on your door, there's life and there's freedom. So we have the, 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 the title, what, what does it imply? The second thing I said was the time of Jesus. There's this personal particular, first of all, regarding Shiloh and Messiah as to, you know, to, to what he would do, what he would be. We just talked about that. But now he talks about this time, and the time thing is this. When is he going to show up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah until Shiloh come. He'd be obviously of the tribe of Judah. And by the way, when you look at the Christmas story, you look at the generations of Jesus, you'll see how in the gospel of Luke, Luke meticulously goes through the lineage of Jesus Christ to prove very clearly that Jesus is from the tribe of Judah. Now you see this messenger coming. When does he come? Well, the saying is that Messiah won't come until something happens. And what happens is this, this rule, this, this scepter is passed. When the authority ceases, then you know that this Shiloh will come. Well, I guess the question would be, when did the rule of Judah cease? When did the rule and the authority of Israel cease? Because it is the indicator of when Messiah would come. And this prophecy declares that he would come right before Jewish law is restricted and before the national identity of Judah is removed. In other words, when Judah can no longer issue law, adjudicate their laws, such as capital punishment or any other law, then you know Shiloh's come. Well, the interesting part in studying the, the whole identity in the nation of Israel, you know that the nation of Israel went through captivity several different times. All right. One was we, the early captivity was with the 70 year Babylonian captivity from 606 to 537 B.C. The southern kingdom of Israel, which is Judah, lost its national sovereignty, but it still retained its national identity and could exercise even under the Babylonian authority certain rights and certain laws. And, and, and still they were in control of their own identity. And that's significant. Because of the prophecy. The, the book of Ezra we read that during the 70 year Babylonian captivity, the Jews still retained their own lawgivers. That's what Ezra records. That even though they were under the captivity of the Babylonians, they did allow them to maintain their identity and their judicial identity and authority over their own people during that 70 years of slavery. 
the, the scepter wasn't lost during the Babylonian captivity. During the next five centuries, the Jews suffered under the yoke of the Medo-Persians, the Greeks, and the Roman empires. Under those three empires, during this long period of time, they're, they're still under a yoke of someone, but yet even while under the yoke, they still have the, the capacity, they're maintaining their tribal identity up until the first quarter of the first century A.D. Everything's good, even though they're in bondage, even though there's captivity, still allowed to, you know, carry out their own identity, still allowed to use their own lawgivers, own law keepers. But yet something happens in the first quarter of the first century A.D. The Jews now under Roman domination, something unprecedented that occurred to them. In fact, according to Josephus, you know, if you go back and you look in history books, not the Bible, but look in the history books, it says according to Josephus in his antiquities, he was a historian, part Jew, part Rome, some, Roman said, some said, but around A.D. 6 or 7, something happened that, uh, that took away their national sovereignty in the area of being their own lawgivers. According to Josephus, in 86-7, the son and successor of King Herod, a man named Herod Archelaus, was dethroned, vanished to Gaul, and in the city of Gaul. He was replaced at this point in time, not by another king at this point in time, all right? He was replaced by a Roman procurator by the name of Caponius, if you look at history. At this point, the legal power that the Sanhedrin held, that the Jews held, was then upon Caponius' arrival, immediately restricted. With the Caponius coming and ascending to leadership there in Israel, the Sanhedrin lose their ability to adjudicate even capital cases. Now that was the normal policy for Rome uh, over nations that they held under their yoke. But Judea, at the first of the Roman domination, they were spared in that regard, and they still could exercise... For whatever reason Rome wanted to let them, they still could exercise their normal authorities and power. But you'll be familiar with this name, not only in history, but also in the Bible. It talks about the ascension of a new Caesar, Caesar Augustus. And Caesar Augustus had just finally had enough of the Jews, enthrones Caponius and removes all their judicial authority when Caponius comes in. That transfer of power is recorded by Josephus. He says in his historical records, says, and now Archelaus, part of Judea, was reduced into a province. And Caponius, one of the equestrian order of the Romans, was sent as a procurator, having the power of life and death put into his hands by Caesar. So here's Caponius. He takes now the power of life and death, takes it away from the nation of Israel. This transfer has taken place. The power of the Sanhedrin to adjudicate capital cases even was immediately removed. Now, in the minds of Jewish leadership, this event signified the removal of the scepter or the national identity of the tribe of Judah. It's now gone. Now, this is not some kind of <clears throat> uh, Christian contrivance when you're trying to, well, this is, shows that this is Messiah. And this is a, you know, there are a number of commentaries or writings by Jewish rabbis through the century called Targums. It's kind of a, a par an Aramaic paraphrase of the Old Testament that were given over certain passages of scriptures. And let me read you from some of these historical references about what would happen and what this dominion meant when it would be go, go away. In Targum on Kelos, it states, the transmission of domain shall not cease from the house of Judah, nor the scribe from his children's children forever until Messiah comes. So he's saying that passage meant when that rule ceases from Judah's hands, they don't have the authority anymore, then Messiah comes. And another Targum called Pseudo-Jonathan, here's another statement. Kings and rulers shall not cease from the house of Judah until King Messiah comes. Another Targum called Yerushalmi states this. Kings shall not cease from the house of Judah until the time of the coming of King Messiah to whom all dominions of the earth shall become subservient. In the Babylonian Talmud, Sanhedrin 98b, Rabbi Johanan says this, the world was created for the sake of Messiah. What is this Messiah's name? 
The schools of the rabbi Sheila said, his name is Shiloh, for it is written, until Shiloh comes. Now all these commentaries really should eliminate, at least in the Jewish mind, all right, as they're preparing for Messiah, in the Jewish mind, all those Jews that lived prior to the Christian era believed that one of the names was, was, was for, for, for Messiah was Shiloh, and that it was clear that Shiloh, Messiah, would come at the moment that all this has ceased and Israel can no longer mandate its own rule and law. When did that happen? Under Caesar Augustus. And it happened as a decree about the time there was a young Jewish boy named Yeshua. Jesus was about 12 years old. That's when it happened. The Jewish legislature was just banded basically. And even though they went through the motions, they still had no power. That's why the Sanhedrin, this Jewish legislature, when it was time to crucify Jesus, that's why they had to go to the Romans to get permission to do it. Prior to the time Jesus was born, they pretty much had the right to do that themselves. Until Shallow comes. I mean, think about it. <laughs> this is the prophecy that Messiah would come before the end of Judah's authority. Jesus comes before the end of Judah's authority is ended. And it ends. So according to the Old Testament, when Judah's authority is ended, at this time in history, then Messiah would come. Well, he came. Just as prophesied, just as scripture says, Judah's authority ends, Jesus is coming down into the world, and Israel still no longer has that kind of sovereignty. In fact, Jesus said in his own prophecies that it would be that way until right before he comes. That the nation of Israel be regathered from around the world, from under all the captivity of all the other nations, prior to his coming. And he called it the budding of the fig tree. He says, when you see the budding of the fig tree, know that my coming, second coming, is nigh. Well, it's, that's why I say there's so many things about prophecy and about scriptures that are just so phenomenal. If you take time to be honest and do an honest look at a, and, and a realistic look at scripture and see what the Bible says, it blows your mind. Now, all that was said about Jesus, all right, prior to his coming, what would take place? And everything happened just as it said it was happened. Now, that's the time. Let's talk about, as I said, lastly, uh, two things. The last two things is the task of Jesus. It says, unto him shall the gathering of all the people be. Well, that's obviously the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, when you look at the life of Christ, you notice, obviously, that he is the gatherer of people. He said about it, when I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. My family got together at Thanksgiving and my mom was sharing with all 50 of us that were gathered there a, a, a few words. And she got just a little bit of this. She says, just imagine for a moment that uh, there's, Jesus leaves and he's ascended and there's 120 people left. And he says, I want you to go into Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the world and make disciples of all men, all nations. Who would have thought that 120 people, 120 people, just 120 people could touch the world the way they did? and the way it's happened. That millions upon millions upon millions and millions of people have come to Christ just as he prophesied. When I be lifted up, I will draw all men in him. He's still drawing all people into him. He's still winning people. He's still reaching lives. And even greater than that, this great gathering that's taking place, one day it's going to be the greatest gathering when we're all gathered together in his kingdom for his glory and standing before the throne of God. Listen, that's, that's, the, that's, that's the task of Jesus to save us, to set us free, to draw us unto himself into the greatest kingdom that ever lived. He's king of kings, the Lord of lords, which is, leads us to the, the, the last point, which is the triumph of Jesus. Now, the prophecy is obviously initially fulfilled in its starting stages with the birth of Christ. And I believe at the resurrection of Jesus Christ, when he says all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth, now you see Jesus taking hold of the scepter. But the world has not yet seen that, but they will see that. It is yet to come when people from all over, from all time and eternity, are going to witness the headship and the kingship of Jesus Christ. The Bible puts it like this. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess to the glory of God the Father that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. That he's the king until Shiloh comes. Revelation puts it this way, and I heard a great voice. Uh, did I pass it up? 
Well, but anyway, it, uh, I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. He will dwell with them. They shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. What a great promise from Scripture. That day is coming. That moment in, in time is coming. So not only is Christ shallow, but he's the one who holds the scepter. The scepter of the universe will rest in the glorious nail-pierced hands of the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, it's his anyway. We read it from the New American Standard like this. and says, until Shiloh comes. But most, most translations of this Scripture... Uh, and, and, and verse 10 of Genesis 49, many sources read it a, a, a little differently that until Shiloh is the title of Messiah, but it goes on to say when he comes, in other words, when he comes to take it, in other words, when he comes, it belongs to him is the whole idea. It will not depart from Judah until he comes. The idea, even the new, NIV puts it like this, until he comes to whom it belongs. The scepter departs until he comes to whom the scepter belongs because the scepter does belong to him. Ezekiel wrote prophetically hundreds, thousand plus years before Christ when he said, until he comes to whom it belongs, rightfully belongs. Amen. This is talking about in Ezekiel, the last king of Judah. And he is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is the one who is the king of kings. Revelations 5 says this. One of the elders said to me, stop weeping, behold the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David has overcome is to open the book and its seven seals. Think about this as I close. Let's step back in time, 2000 plus years, Jesus is born. 2000 plus years, there's a group of people who are religiously, supposedly committed to the scriptures, have studied the prophecies of Messiah their whole life. Every mother in Israel has hoped that Messiah would be their son. I mean, the whole nation is looking towards that moment when Shiloh comes. And when he comes, nobody's ready. Sound like the church today, doesn't it? You would think that when those wise men from the east came knocking at the door and met with the religious leaders and said, where is this one who's coming? Oh, it's going to be, that, that'll, be, that'll take place in Bethlehem, right? Yeah, that's, that's right. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Bethlehem, yeah. That's what, what the scripture says, will be born in Bethlehem. You would have thought, they'd say, oh, man, well, we don't, you know, it wasn't just too many years ago, we, we lost the, our national identity. And what happens when we lose our, oh, Messiah comes. Hey, we're coming with you guys. <laughs> we're on our way with you. You'd think they'd got there before them. But again, it's like the church today and so many today. We have... We, we talk about all these prophecies concerning Christ. Do you realize for every one prophecy in regard to the first coming of Jesus, that there are eight prophecies concerning the second coming of Jesus? At what time and what the world be like and what season, what's going on economically, what's going on, you know, with the governments of the world. That season is upon us. I mean, there's so many things that have happened in the scriptures. I mean, why are we waiting for them? Obviously, if you've never given your life to Christ, I don't know what you're waiting on. God has so sovereignly addressed our need through his son, Jesus Christ. He has rearranged his, in fact, history is his story. All right. He's just sovereignly laid out everything for us. That everything he said would happen, happened. Everything he says is going to happen, it's happening. And will soon happen. What are you waiting for? I wouldn't walk out this building until I knew that I knew I knew that I had peace with God in my heart because I put my faith in Christ. I put my trust in him. We're saved by grace through faith. It's not of ourselves, lest any man should boast, and not of our works. Grace, grace, grace. And for believers, let's don't be counted with that, that religious group who had the information in their heads, but they had no unction and they had no transformation in their lives. Would you stand with your heads bowed?